Thank you, Rob. Are you ready for dinosaurs? Yeah. Good. I love them. I think they're fascinating. I look at the ones in the lobby and, and just, can you see it against the black background? It's a leg. That's just one leg. So I like to think about how this thing looked when it was fully fleshed. And I like to imagine maybe how it sounded or how they walked. They're just cool. Dinosaurs are cool. But when I look at them, especially in the lobby, and I get contemplative, I start to think about basic questions like, where did these things come from? Where did they go? Why are they extinct? And, and when were they alive? These are some of the basic big picture questions that I ask about dinosaurs. And it turns out that I talk to a lot of people who ask me these questions and they're confused. There's so much confusion about dinosaurs. It's, it's like a dinosaur dilemma. Well, for some Christians, they don't really worry about it. It's no big deal. Other Christians, it's something that rattles around in the back of their mind. Yeah, there's questions that are unresolved about dinosaurs. I don't have the solutions yet. But it's not a big deal. But listen, for some Christians, it's a big deal. They can't seem to put together, we, I should say, can't seem to put together the pieces. How do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible's big picture? I, I, can't, I can't seem to figure this out. What are we going to do with dinosaurs? And that's what we're all about tonight. Reminds me of a conversation I had just three weeks ago with a gal. It's so typical. She said, my son Johnny loves dinosaurs, but all the material that I can find on dinosaurs says millions of years. And it says, dinosaurs evolved. And I don't think that millions of years is in the Bible. And I know evolution is not in the Bible because it says God created. And I don't know what to do with dinosaurs. How do I help my son Johnny? She said, I'm tempted to just tell him that they don't even exist. That's a solution. I don't recommend it. But this, is so, this dinosaur dilemma is a big deal. And listen, it's a really big deal for people who are leaving the church. We have generations. The youngest generation is now leaving the church. They're deciding whether or not they're going to believe and trust the Bible and take it as God's word while they're still age 12 and 13. Their decision doesn't become manifest usually until they leave your house and go to college. But parents, I think part of the problem is you just haven't been equipped. We as parents don't have the equipment all the time to train and educate our kids and kind of teach them the way to go. And so when we don't have that equipment, here's what happens. Here's what happens in little Johnny's mind, little Sarah, Susie. She says, here's millions of years, here's evolution, and everything I learned about dinosaurs is in these terms. And now watch. Susie opens her Bible, and she says, there's no millions of years here. In fact, it presents a case for a world that's only thousands of years old, and there's no evolution here. In fact, it says God created after their kind. Directly contradicting, uh, contradicting evolution. So, which one am I going to choose? So little Johnny is deciding at age 13, this history or that history? And really, it's about two different histories. What we're going to do tonight, or try to do, is to look at five clues. Do we have them up? Great. We're going to take five clues that you haven't necessarily probably been shown or told. It's going to be exciting. And we're going to compare our five clues with the Bible. And we're going to see, do these mismatch or do they line up? Are you ready for the five clues? Okay. Good. Clue number one is crafty design. Now, if you are 10 years old or younger, you have a special task tonight. I want you to say out loud each of my five clues as, I get to the, uh, as we get to them. So if you're, 10, if you're 11 or older, I know that you're actually 10 years old at heart, so you're allowed to say it out loud with us. In addition, we're going to encounter dinosaur names, the big, long, funny ones to say. And so your job is to keep me awake by saying those names out loud when we come to them. Can you do that? Okay. Ten or younger say crafty design. 
that was weak. We must not have very many 10-year-olds. I thought we had more 10 at heart. Well, we'll have to go with what we've got. Crafty design. Well, here's the thing. If the evolution history is true, we would expect to see, for example, transitions from a non-dinosaur along a continuum up to dinosaur. For example, if we're trying to evolve from some kind of lizard to a sauropod dinosaur. Now, you have to say sauropod. sauropod. Good, you're getting better. These are the ones with four on the floor. So four on the floor, long tail, long neck. We should have a series of pre-dinosaurs Longer necks, longer necks, longer tails, longer tails, till eventually we arrive at a fully formed sauropod dinosaur. What do we actually see in the fossils? Do we find these things in the fossils? Well, what we see instead of these transitions is we see fully formed, crafty design right from the start. It's either a sauropod or it's some other creature. For example, here's a sauropod. It's named Argentinosaurus. Argentinosaurus. I bet you can't guess what country it was found in. <laughs> 110 feet long. This is massive. This creature was huge. Of course, it was probably a granddaddy, great, 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 great granddaddy. But a big, huge creature. Let's look at some of the crafty design that's built in to a creature that's that big. If you had to build a creature or anything that's that big, it's going to be heavy, isn't it? Many, many tons. Something that's heavy is going to have to have what? Crafty design in order to support all that weight. It's exactly what Argentinosaurus and other sauropod dinosaurs have. So we're going to zoom in on the hip. See the hip? What do you see there? I see arches. I see arches. And when we have arches built into structural designs to support weight, that is an indication of crafty design. We see it in different places. We see it, for example, at this, at this ancient um, Roman construction in uh, the city of Ephesus. Paul the Apostle may have seen this with the roof on. <laughs> But this arch supported a heavy roof, and that heavy roof lying on the arch rests on pillars. This is just like the sauropods. They have an arch on their hip, so all that sauropod weight can rest right there. And they had pillar-like legs with knees that locked. Other dinosaurs, knees were bent, and they were, they were crouching, and they were ready to roll. But <laughs> sauropods, they could just stand there, and all their weight was supported by this crafty design in their hip structure. Amazing, great design. Let's look in detail at some of the crafty design in just one sauropod vertebra. Okay, where is your vertebra? Tell someone next to you. Good, backbone, it's in your spine. So this is just one vertebra. It doesn't look like any of the other dinosaur vertebrae. I'll show you one much later in this presentation. This one has weight-saving features. Do you see them? Let's point some of them out. We have holes, divots, hollow spaces. We have raised ridges, weight-saving features. See them? Divots, I was told I have to point the arrow at both sides, so it's gonna take us twice as long tonight. <laughs> You'll be patient, but you can, you can see the uh, the plug-in there for scale. <laughs> I ride bicycles, and I noticed that my bicycle has weight-saving features. It has holes and raised ridges and strength-strengthening parts and weight-saving uh, uh, parts where the material has been removed. That's just crafty design. That's what makes my bike go fast, and it's lightweight. So when I see the same kind of crafty design in a creature, I'm saying it looks well made. Here's the ultimate. Here's the ultimate. Well, that's not the ultimate. <laughs> uh, definitely not. But I'm holding something. This is special. This is a hadrosaur egg. I found it at a rock shop, and uh, 
In fact, Mr. Hansen was over here. He, he took the picture of me with his cell phone. I appreciate that. And we're in uh, South... Uh, help me, Michael. Is he in the back? So one of the states that starts with the name South. Carolina, something. We're in a rock shop, and it said Hadrosaur Egg. And so I picked it up, and I thought, this would be great. I could buy this and have it at seminars and show people what a real Hadrosaur Egg looked like. And then I turned it over, and it said $400. And so I put it right back down. <laughs> But here's the ultimate in crafty design, in my opinion. You think you're a great engineer, right? You think you can build a great tower of Legos, you can build a great church. You get yolk and egg white, that's all you get. Make that, and it has to be in your hand, it can fit in, the, in your hand, and after some number of months, I want you to build a machine that changes yolk and egg white into a dinosaur. That's amazing. That's crafty design. So that's our first clue. First clue is what? So what we're going to do is we're going to compare our first clue, crafty design, with the scripture. What does scripture say about living creatures? It says, God made. God made the beasts of the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but if anything qualifies as a beast of the earth, it's a dinosaur. Okay, God made the beast of the earth, Genesis 1. You see, crafty design fits creation. So that's what we see. We don't see half-baked, mismatched, semi-formed dinosaurs. It's fully proportional, all the parts in place. It's all ready to go, these dinosaurs. They're amazingly well-designed. So that fits. Let's zoom in on this next Idea. Do you see where it says, after their own kind? I think that's worth attention. This is a uh, picture of the ceratopsian kind. You have to say that. Ceratopsian. Now, what makes a ceratopsian a ceratopsian? It's got four on the floor, but doesn't have a long neck. It's got a short neck, short tails, and it's got that head crest. We've got one in the lobby. Now, the most famous ceratopsian is the... Triceratops, but there are many others. There's some that had more horns, some had fewer horns, some had no horns, some had a lot of horns, some had horns on the top, some had horns on the side, some had bent horns, some had straight horns. <gasps> a lot of different varieties of ceratopsians. But they're all revolving around this theme, the ceratopsian theme. You see, I think God, not only should he get credit for designing the ceratopsian in general, I think he also should get credit for designing a dinosaur that has the ability to produce variation so that it can fill its purpose. What was its purpose? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth in all of its ever-changing environments. Maybe that's what those ceratopsians were doing before they got turned into fossils. So that's our first clue. Created design, crafty design, looks like creation. Second clue, everybody say catastrophic death. Very good, thank you. Not just any old catastrophe, but the main feature about dinosaur fossils, the main thing we notice from the fossils is that they are in uh, graveyards, fossil graveyards, junk pit dump pits in the rocks. Lots of dinosaurs jumbled up with all kinds of other creatures that were, listen, buried in a watery mud catastrophe. Mud and water mixed together with lots of different creatures. That's the second clue, catastrophic death. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a, here's a dinosaur. I think that's a picture of a Camarasaurus. Look at the mud. See, the mud surrounded this creature, and then later it hardened. What happens to an animal when it dies today? Are they turning into fossils today? No, fossilization is unique. It requires a unique set of circumstances. What happens today, when an animal dies, the scavengers come. It becomes raccoon food. And then it becomes worm food. And it's gone within a matter of uh, uh, years at the most. Months, something like that. Well, look, that didn't happen. He was preserved through a catastrophic burial in mud brought in by water. All these fossils were. Now, I'm facing catastrophic death here. 
Actually, I'm facing a man who I asked to take my picture. This is in uh, Hill City, South Dakota, 2010, I think. And I said, can you take my picture? And he never said one, two, three or anything. He just mashed the button. So I'm waiting for him to say <laughs> something. But I want us to think about this T-Rex that's behind me. Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> On your toes, people. <laughs> Seven tons. Seven tons. <laughs> this thing is massive. But look. If he died of natural causes, what would have happened? Even he would have been scavenged. Even he would turn into worm dirt, worm food, fungus food, bacteria food. He'd be gone within a matter of years at the most, just a few years. But he's, all his bones are there. Listen, he was overwhelmed by mud that was moving, listen, faster than he could run or else what? He, he would just run out of the way. It was moving with more force than he could generate. Otherwise, he would just... Step right out of the way. Didn't do it. Completely buried catastrophically. Catastrophic death. That's really the main feature that we see in dinosaur fossil bearing rocks is that we've got all kinds of mud moving so fast that it buried and, and preserved things that were fragile, short-lived, even plants. For example, this cycad. Now, if you don't it, if you want to say the plant names today, you sure can. Cycads. Thanks. I love cycads because they're found in dinosaur rock layers. And every time I see cycads, like when I drive through In N Out Burger, yee they got the cycads as their ornament plants. And I tell my kids, look, it's dinosaur plants. These are fun. And so I'm so excited about cycads that I made my daughter take a picture, pose next to one so you could see her. She's like, Dad, why are you taking a picture of this? That's literally what she told me anyways. She didn't know she was going to be in front of so many, but <laughs> that's amazing. So this, this plant is a dinosaur plant. And what else do we have uh, in dinosaur-bearing rock layers? Name that. Palm, palm tree. Uh, turtles wouldn't be in there, would they? Yeah. Lizards with dinosaurs? Yeah. Turtles, lizards, um, Mammals, surely they're not in there. Listen, some rock layers have more different species of mammals than they have different species of dinosaurs. Mammals and dinosaurs all rolled up together. Fish wouldn't be there. Fish didn't live where dinosaurs lived. Well, guess what? They died where the dinosaurs died, and they got buried in the same rock layers. Fish, clams, water creatures, palms, cycads, insects. It was a mess. It was a catastrophic mess. It was a catastrophic death. And that's the number two clue. This is one of our favorite fossils at the Institute for Creation Research. It's hanging on our wall. And what do you see there? You see a dinosaur and a fish. By the way, that's a sturgeon. And over 150 supposed million years of evolution, the sturgeon has transformed itself into a sturgeon. <laughs> Okay, this is a great name. Say this, Sinosauropteryx. Yeah, it's a fun one. But look, he had legs. He walked on land. Fish had fins, lived in the water. They didn't live in the same place, but they got buried in the same place. Catastrophic death that involved lots of moving mud, fast-moving water. That's our second clue. It's catastrophic death. Now, we're going to take our second clue, and we're going to Compare it to the scripture. What does the Bible say? Genesis chapter 7, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. By the way, it's not the Himalayas. They weren't formed yet. That's the high hills that existed in the pre-flood world. The waters prevailed, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. We had, if the Bible is right, we should expect to see lots of dead creatures that were buried by water. What do we see around earth? What are we standing on right here in North Texas? Hundreds of feet of sedimentary rocks that contain dead creatures buried in water. Just what we'd expect to find if the Bible is right about the flood of Noah. So the catastrophic death is a significant major clue that we get from dinosaur fossils and these dinosaur fossils were formed in Noah's flood. 
So they're flood fossils. So the catastrophic death matches Noah's flood. Clue number three, here it comes. And you can uh, say definitely catastrophe. This is Dinosaur Valley National Monument in Utah. And what are these guys looking at? Sauropod dinosaur bones all jumbled up, mixed up together that were buried in mud along with lots of fish bones, which are too small to see from this distance, but they're mixed in there. Fish fossil bones and clams and snails and uh, 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 all kinds of other creatures mixed in there. Definitely catastrophe. That's fun to say. That's, that's flood fossils. Third clue, say clashes with dragons. Now, let's talk about the word dragons. When I say dragon, I know you think large, dumpy creature with teeny tiny wings and somehow it flies. I'm not talking about that. Um, but I do think that, uh, I don't think that would work, okay? I do think that the word dragon, which is used in cultures all over Europe, indicates that these people probably encountered something, something real. Maybe these clashes with dragons that are recorded in all different um, nationalities, all different people groups, have legends of dragons. Maybe they're actually pointing us to something that was real. Let's look at these clues. These clues are systematically ignored. They're not in the fossils. So to look at these clues, we have to look at history. Great place to look to find out how things happened in the past. So we have artifacts. Now I'm going to show you a bunch of different artifacts, and they look kind of like dinosaurs to me. I'll let you be the judge of them, so that's why I'm going to show them to you. But listen, all these artifacts predate paleontology. Does that make sense? So paleontology is in the last, say, few hundred years. Now, someone could fake it if they saw it in a picture book, but the picture books that show these creatures didn't get published until the last hundred years or so. All these artifacts are way older than that. So what were they looking at when they carved or painted these dragons or dinosaur-looking uh, creatures? Let's look at them. And if even one of them is genuine... It throws a giant wrench into the whole idea that dinosaurs lived in some age long before man. I don't, I don't find good evidence for that, frankly. I find too many clues that humans encountered dragons for real, real kind of something. What was the dragon? Maybe these are depictions that showed what they really looked like. Like this totem pole. By the way, what makes... A dinosaur reptile different from other reptiles. Thinking about it, you think size? The average size of a dinosaur was about the size of a turkey. The Sinoceropteryx I showed you was about the size of a chicken. By the way, so they could have fit on the ark. You just get the small ones and they would have fit fine. We'll get there in a minute. No, that's not it. The main difference between dinosaur reptiles and other reptiles is that dinosaur legs went straight down. Other reptiles, legs go out and then down, like lizards and crocodiles. The legs go out and then they bend down. So lizards waddle, <laughs> dinosaurs walk, or, or they walked, but the legs go straight down. And that's what I'm looking for in these depictions. Are they really, do they match sort of what we'd expect to see based on dinosaur fossil remains? Like this one with the long neck, long tail, legs that go straight down, and a man uh, plunging his spear into its back. Uh, uh, what about these from Acambaro, Mexico, where we've got these long neck, long tail, ooh, dermal frills, we call these skin flaps along the spine. Long tail, long neck, legs that go straight down on some of these. Let's investigate these, find out what were they looking at when they made these figurines. Or we can go to France, and we can go to Chateau du Bois, that's fun to say. And uh, actually, you can go there, and uh, it's called Salamander Castle, and you can get the T-shirt that says, I went to Salamander Castle. Okay, <laughs> salamander legs, out or down? Out. Salamander skin, scales or smooth? Smooth. Well, all over the castle, we have depictions of this. Scaly skin, legs that go down. And look at the little baby one, isn't he cute? <laughs> you people are, oh, you actually gave me the aw. Oh. Oh, look at the little cutie. But when he grows up, he'll eat your children. <laughs> it's 
So go easy on the all. Well, these, these, these dragons are shown on castles all over medieval uh, Europe. Here's another um, French uh, castle. Oh, so my question is, were they looking at something like Skeletosaurus that we know from fossils? Maybe, I don't know. What about the Chateau du Chambord? Were we looking at this, this uh, creature? Long neck, long tail, and legs that go sort of, sort of down, maybe. Perhaps it was a dinosaur. Maybe he was looking at uh, a blank screen when he drew that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Plateosaurus, say that. Yeah. Uh, here's another... Here's another artifact. This one's amazing. It's from Angkor Wat. It's in Cambodia. And this is a temple discovered, I think, about 10 years ago. It was shrouded and covered in jungle vines. And they hacked through and found this temple buried in the jungle. And uh, here's a column in the temple. And on the column are depictions of normal animals like a monkey, a parrot. And here's a bull. There's a bull above it. And what does this look like to you? Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus. I showed this to a, an unbeliever friend. And I was just scrolling through my slides, and I, I said, so this is this, and that is that, and I wasn't giving him much Bible, I just wanted to give him the clues, and he said, and I flipped to this one, and he goes, that's a stegosaurus, They're just like that. Okay, well, how did these people draw it? How did these people carve it as, as a bas-relief in this, in this temple? Maybe they were looking at a stegosaurus, I don't know. What about Narmer palette? And we have a long neck, long tail, and uh, feet and legs that go straight down interesting looking. The, the necks are intertwined, kind of like these necks intertwined at Carlisle Cathedral in the UK. Long neck, it's been rubbed off because of centuries of people walking on this. It's a brass fillet that surrounds Bishop Bell's tomb in this cathedral. So next time you go to England, go to the north and go to the Carlisle Cathedral and ask the, uh, the, guy, the caretakers there to lift the rug and they'll perhaps show this to you. And it's got deer and foxes and normal animals all carved on this thing. And then there's this, legs that go straight down. Amazing. We call it Bishop Bell's Brass Behemoth. <laughs> Our own Dr. Tim Clary went and visited Ontario, the Lake Superior Provincial Parks. Um, he's our geologist. And he loved, he loved to go visit this and take, this, take a picture of this um, uh, ancient uh, painting on the rock um, pronounced, I guess, something like Mishibiju by the Ojibwa t tribe and the Algonquin peoples. And anyways, just look at this. Legs straight down, dermal frills, a couple of giant snakes, and some dudes in a canoe. <laughs> oh, yeah. For you people. Dermal frills, legs go straight down, two snakes, dudes canoe. You saw that? <laughs> I don't know what they were looking at, but uh, it looked monstrous and scary and worthy of painting, maybe. Were they looking at Sauropelta, which we know from fossils? I don't know. ICR's own Daryl Robbins went and took a trip a couple years ago to Utah, Natural Bridges National Monument, and he saw this. And people that go to it physically instantly recognize it, and they say, that looks like a dinosaur. And they call it the dinosaur carving. And it's a, a pictograph where they took a, a deer antler, and they chipped away the rock and left uh, an imprint uh, this is genuine, and it's ancient, and it looks like what it is. Um, and so we have a long neck, long tail, and, um, and, and some confusing legs down there at the bottom. <laughs> Were they looking at a sauropod dinosaur, maybe a diplodocus? A students here, <laughs> responsive here. I want to hear it from everyone else. Diplodocus. Thank you. See, it helps me as a speaker to know that you're with me. Were they looking at something like this whenever they carved these things? Well, I heard a rumor that there was some dinosaur-looking cave paintings at a place called Painted Cave, and it's in uh, Di uh, Bandelier National um, Monument, I think is what it's called, in New Mexico. So I went last summer, and here's the cave from a distance, and I wanted to get up close. So it's 10 miles from the place where you park, and then it'll be 10 miles back. And so here's my uh, crew of intrepid explorers, including my son, who's in front with the strange posture. And um, <laughs> he's wearing a T-shirt that says, Warning. I think he's probably directing that at women. <laughs> but here we go. Through the deserts of New, of Mexi New Mexico. And we, and we go and we get lost and we have no water and we turn a 20-mile hike into a marathon. 
and we barely make it back, but we got the photos, and so we're thankful to the Lord that he preserved our lives. And look at this interesting collection of paintings in Painted Cave. You should, you should go, but when you go, bring like 500 gallons of water. I don't know what these are. I'm still looking at it and still investigating it, but we have normal creatures. We've got a wolf there. We've got a man. We've got a, a horse and uh, something that looks dinosaurian. And this one here, it's got a long tail, two legs that go down. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a dinosaur. It could be a kangaroo. I mean, I'm still looking at it. You can be the judge. You've seen what I'm seeing. These things are all over. Not only do we have art, we also have writing. Listen, here's the point. Clue number three. Clashes with dragons is telling us that history is saturated with evidence that humans encountered giant lizard-like creatures all over the globe. North America, South America, Australia all have their legends all over Europe. And they're all saying one thing, encounters with dragons. Marco Polo wrote about his encounter. Alexander the Great said, we went here and conquered these people. Then we went and conquered this dragon. Daniel in the Apocrypha, etc., etc. History is just resounding with this evidence, with this clue number three, clashes with dragons. Well, let's compare that with the scripture. And in particular, we're going to look at Job. This is a fantastic passage. I love this passage. And here's God speaking to Job out of the whirlwind, and God says, look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. I sometimes imagine that here's God speaking to Job out of the whirlwind, and God is saying, okay, now, look over there at the behemoth right there, which I made with you. In other words, dinosaurs and man made together on the same day, day six of creation. He eats grass like an ox. Well, dinosaurs didn't eat grass because according to evolution, grass is a flowering plant and flowering plants didn't evolve until millions of years after the dinosaur age. (gasps) Except we just found dinosaur dung with little grass bits in it. Sauropod dinosaurs ate grass. We know from fossils and it matches perhaps what this is saying. See now his strength is in his hips. His hips and his loins. The strongest, most central portion of his body is going to be here. He moves his, this is the key feature. He moves his tail like a cedar. Now, in your Bible, it may say in the translator's notes, which are not inspired. (laughs) Translator's notes says, this is probably a hippopotamus. Now, I cannot think of a worse way to describe the little hippopotamus flip-flap tail than to say it was a cedar tree. (laughs) He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. And here's an early 20th century um, reconstruction based on fossils. And they said, well, it hadn't quite yet evolved, and so it's got the tail that it has to drag along all the time because it doesn't have the strength to hold up the tail. Well, years later, we found out that that the... uh, Uh, better reconstructions uh, discovered that, hey, it could have held its tail because it has crafty design. It has weight-saving features. So they used what words they had in order to translate it into English, and they had the word dragon. Does the King James use the word dragon? Yes, in different places throughout the Scripture. So that's our our third clue, clashes with dragons. Now look what's happening here. Our clues are matching what the Scripture says. Crafty design matches creation. Catastrophic death by water matches the flood. Clashes with dragons matches Job. Now let's look at our fourth and fifth clues, which are going to help us answer the question, when? When did dinosaurs live? So yeah, these dragons, these dinosaurs um, were wiped out from the pre-flood world. Some of them got on the ark, uh, only needed about 60, 60 uh, uh, pairs to go on the ark. That would have represented all the basic dinosaur kinds. Didn't have to take every species because, you know, paleontologists love to attach their names to things, so they they overnamed these creatures, and they're basically only 60 different dinosaur kinds represented on the ark. Well, when they got off the ark, along with all these other animals, what did they do? They filled the the mud planet. They filled the, the earth. And what did the people do? They made a huddle in Babel. And while people were huddling in Babel, the dinosaurs and creatures were going and filling the earth. 
And then God dispersed the creatures, uh, the people from Babel by introducing to them languages. They got scared and they said, well, we better obey God's command, which was repeated to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, which said, fill the earth. Don't make a huddle in Babel. Go fill the earth. So they finally went and filled the earth. And when they did so, they had clashes with dragons. Now, I don't know about you, but when my kids are in the back playing, I'd rather a dragon not come and eat them. So when that happened to the people of yore, they probably got together with the other guys in the neighborhood and said, grab your spear, grab your club, grab your stick, grab your AK-47, and let's go get rid of this threat because I want my kids to survive. So I think due to clashes with dragons, they went extinct in one neighborhood after another. Until now, people have uh, filled the earth in such a way that dragons are probably extinct everywhere, although there may be some tiny places where we haven't yet reached. I wouldn't be surprised to find a living dinosaur somewhere. It would fit uh, what the Bible clues have. No problem. But let's look at our fourth clue. It's called collagen decay. So say that. Thank you very much. Collagen is a protein. We need to talk about a little bit of science, but it's going to be simplified and made easy for you. In fact, it's so easy that it has to boil down to shoes. These shoes are like 10 years old, and they're made of leather. What is leather made of? 95% collagen. So collagen is a tough, stringy protein. That's what makes leather last. How long does leather last? How long can collagen last? Well, old harnesses in my grandfather's garage get, get frayed and, and cracked, and then they turn into dust. So collagen does turn into dust. So what we have is a clock. We have a ticking down process. Collagen starts with high integrity. I'm going to draw a graph with my hands if you're ready for this. Starts with high integrity. I'm going to flip it over here. And then it goes, after a time, it starts to fall apart. And then it starts to fall apart. And then eventually it falls apart to where you have nothing but dust. So we have a time to dust window. So if we find collagen, like leather or parchment or something like that, anywhere, we know that that thing ha- has been around within this time window. So scientists have measured the decay rate of collagen, and uh, this is going to become significant. Track with me on this. Scientists have measured it so that we know that the maximum shelf life is about 900 years. Now, this, this includes all the, um, the best-case scenario. This assumes that there's, no, that there's no water, because once water gets mixed with collagen, it degrades it. It, 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 it uh, includes that it's sterile. Once bacteria get to it, it's going to wipe it out. Why am I talking about collagen? Where is collagen? Collagen, listen, it's in your skin. That's what makes your skin uh, flexible and tough. That's what makes leather. It's also in your bones. It, what's, it's what holds your bones together, like rebar in concrete or the steel belts in your radial tires. Uh, encased in rubber. So collagen fibers are all throughout the connective tissues and and other tissues in your body and in dinosaur bodies. So surely, if these things are millions of years old, there would be absolutely no collagen left because we know that the time window maximum possible is 900,000 years. Do we find collagen in dinosaur remains? Well, Secular scientists did it for us. So we just watch them and um, like it. (laughs) So the story goes like this. Um, A team of researchers under the direction of Dr. Sorry, Mr. Jack Horner were uh, were excavating a large T-Rex from a Montana hillside, the rock formation called the um, Hell Creek Formation, and it was too big. So they lifted up with helicopter, but the helicopter... Um, uh, it couldn't handle the weight. So they made a field decision and they chopped the big thing in half. And um, so that means that they had a a, a rock with half of the dinosaur T-Rex femur bone. That's this bone here, largest bone in your body and T-Rexes. And the other chunk of rock with the other half of the bone. And then they were able to heli lift, helicopter lift, whatever the word for that is, in two separate segments. And that provided what? an opportunity for the first time for paleontologists to look inside the broken open bone. 
What did they see in what is known as the world's best preserved dinosaurs from this formation? Here are some of the images that they took and published in, um, in uh, 1995. More were found in 2000. Now, this is still colored red. Why? Well, the scientists wondered why themselves, and so they detected hemoglobin protein. So we have collagen. We also have hemoglobin, and it's um, not really supposed to be there if it's that old. The rules of science say that it can't survive even one million years old. Sorry, one million years. Where did that rule come from? It came from laboratory experiments. I don't think it poses a challenge to that existing rule. I think it poses a challenge to the millions of years age assignment. But maybe it's just me. <laughs> Did we find other collagen in more dinosaur bones than just that one T-Rex? Absolutely. So we have it in a hadrosaur. And these are all uh, published in secular literature. Found it in a cetacosaur. I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute. Skin fibers. Uh, proteins in a seismosaur from New Mexico. And uh, just two months ago in the journal Nature, they published collagen protein in an egg from a lufengosaur. Say that when it's fun. <laughs> collagen protein and other proteins in, in, um, in the embryonic lufengosaur. It came from a rock layer that they designated as 190 million years old. But it has collagen in it. But collagen is supposed to go away after only uh, 900,000 years old, not even a million years. So I, you know, sometimes these dates remind me of Congress, you know, where they, <laughs> where they invent these numbers. I think we'll put a billion dollars over here and we'll, a trillion dollars over here and... Millions and trillions and billions, it's just all numbers. I don't think that these numbers are right. I think there's, they're missing something. They're not following the right clues. Uh, we have it in a hadrosaur bone. We have, we have this from a hadrosaur, blood vessels, bone cells called osteocytes. And I collected a bunch of these secular reports and put it on, a, on our website. <laughs> it's all over the place. We've got it in China. We've got it in South America. We've got it in Europe, of course, America. Uh, we have special pockets where this soft tissue, this original tissue is in all different... We've got it in lizards. We've got it in birds. We've got it in all kinds of different fossil creatures, monkeys. Here's the uh, Cetacosaurus. Cetacosaurus. And look at these collagen protein fibers that the scientists imaged. This stuff is still there. It's like a mummified, natural mummy dinosaur. Here's a uh, mosasaur. You can say that if you want. And this is a swimming reptile. It's an extinct marine reptile. And uh, look at the red patches. You can see this one here. There's another one here. Well, the scientists who investigated this recently were curious about what gives it the color red. They thought maybe some iron-rich mineral leached in there. Maybe there's some kind of a magnet stuck in there or something and um, brought in the iron minerals. Well, they did find iron, but they also found hemoglobin, which, of course, is what holds the iron in your blood. But they found hemoglobin protein fragments. They found collagen. They found all kinds of proteins. They found the scales uh, of this creature. And, in fact, they found those two red patches right where you would expect the heart and the liver to have been when this creature was alive. These things look young, not millions, just thousands of years old, based on the science of collagen decay. Uh, we have um, other kind of proteins too and, and biomolecules like the dark colored um, patches here. You know, some scientists call these dark colored portions uh, 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 feathers. They call them dinosaur feathers. Um, I think rather that they may be something like this that's just the residue of skin flaps and there's not feathers at all. I don't believe the dinosaur feather hype I, I will if I see actual dinosaur feathers. I haven't seen one yet. So, to summarize, I'm going to give you a science graph, but it's a bar graph. It's really easy uh, to me, okay? It should be easy to all of us. 70 million is the age assignment. These are the age assignments. These are the age assignments. But look, here's the cutoff. 
So they shouldn't have gone past, they shouldn't have gone above this red line cutoff at 900,000 years. And that's the collagen decay. So what we're seeing is that the science of collagen decay, clue number four, matches what scripture indicates about the age of the world. Even Jesus affirmed this. And he said when he was refuting the Pharisees, but from the beginning of the creation, have you not read Pharisees? God made them male and female. Who's he talking about? Who's male and female? Adam and Eve. Thank you, one person who's with me. (laughs) Adam and Eve. From the beginning of creation. Look, here's the beginning. It's where time began, space began. Here's the beginning. Here's Adam and here's Eve. From the beginning. Not millions of years after the beginning. Jesus took Genesis straightforwardly, and there's no scientific reason why we couldn't either. Here's the, 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 uh, the next clue. Ready for the next and last final clue? It's called carbon decay. Say that if you want. And he, here's how it came about. I thought to myself, well, we've got collagen protein, and I know that collagen contains carbon. And I know that carbon sometimes has carbon-14, and carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope or version of carbon, and it's falling apart. It turns itself into nitrogen so that it has a, another time window. But look, the time window for carbon-14 is different than that for collagen. The collagen time window is about 900,000 years, but look, the carbon-14 window is only 100,000 years. So if you find carbon-14 in any sample, then that sample had to have been deposited or made within 100,000 years. Is, uh, is an earth that's 6,000 years old, does that fit within the 100,000 years? Yes. What about a million years? Does that fit inside the 100,000 year window? No. So I'm thinking, can I find some carbon-14 in dinosaur bone material? Do you think I did? Maybe. So the maximum shelf life after 100,000 years, no detectable carbon-14 should be left in any sample. So I found a hadrosaur vertebra that was from the Hell Creek Formation, the same formation that has these most famous, well-preserved dinosaurs. And there's my gloved hand preparing the sample and sending it off to the lab. And sure enough, it came back with plenty of readable carbon-14. So I added my results to those of some others who are working on the same uh, uh, research. And we have all these amazing finds. We've got, this is not yet published, but we've actually tried to submit this data to five different scientific journals. All of them have said, no, we don't like this, we don't like this. Um, We're going to try two more, and then we're going to publish it in a creation journal, which is just as high quality, uh, but probably not the same uh, uh, level of readership. Anyway, that's kind of where I'm at with this, but we have all kinds of great data. We've got five different hadrosaur bones, they all have carbon-14, two different triceratops bones, acrocanthosaurus, cetacosaurus, diplodocus, stegosaurus, all these we found with carbon-14 still in them. And it matches what the Institute for Creation Research did uh, 10, 8 years ago in the RATE project where we found carbon-14 in diamonds, carbon-14 in coal, oil, natural gas, anywhere you look in earth materials you find carbon-14. Why? Because it's young. It's not as old as they claim. So I got two clocks, two clocks, my last two clues, collagen decay and carbon decay, and they match what the scripture indicates about the age of the world, which says in um, uh, Exodus 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them rested on the seventh day. And that's the basis for the work week, literal week. So here's the big picture. Mom, dad, Don't let little Johnny and little Sally escape your house, graduate at 18, without giving them some kind of answers. Because if you don't, they're going to have a problem and they're going to be faced with an issue. And they may do what too many have tragically done, and that is jettison the scripture. We don't want that to happen, so let's give them the clues. Let's give them the clues and let them put the pieces together. Created on day six. Flooded. The flood formed the dinosaurs. That's how they went extinct before the flood. Then they went extinct after they got off the ark as people encountered and removed them. Extinct from dragon slayers. Here's the bottom line. Here's the big picture. Here's why we're here. Dinosaurs fit the big picture of the Bible. And there's no evidence that dinosaurs present that really contradicts. 
So when we match the clues with what the Bible says, we find this wonderful agreement so that I can take, listen, I can take Genesis and read it as though it was saying exactly what it says, the way Jesus took it when he read it. You can trust your Bible from the very first verse. We're going to take a few minutes here to do some Q&A, and we've got some questions that will be posed up on the screens, and uh, Brian will do his best to answer those. So question one, some creationists postulate that some dinosaurs breathed fire. Has there been any further findings? No. (laughs) I don't know who those creationists are. Are, well, oh, we, yeah, okay, so Dr. Uh, Gish suggested that in the book we have in the back called Dinosaurs by Design, um, but I have found no further evidence that, that uh, dinosaurs breathe fire. We do have scriptural evidence that Leviathan breathed fire, um, so that's in the Bible, and so Leviathan, however, was not a dinosaur because by definition a dinosaur walked on land, Leviathan was a sea creature. And he lived in the oceans. I think he went extinct because it had nostrils and it had to surface for air. Therefore, he encountered people in boats. And so uh, I would think if there's a, a, a young Leviathan uh, that's in my way, that uh, I'm going to get all my boat friends together with our harpoons and spears and get rid of that threat. I think that's what happened to the Leviathan, unfortunately. Um, but it breathes fire, according to Scripture. All right, very good. Here's the next one. Why would God give some dinos such short arms? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, I don't really have a good answer. Who's who's fielding these for me? Uh, Some creatures have little nubs of bones inside their body, and they only use it when it's reproduction time. Uh, and so maybe it was something like that. It definitely the T-Rex had these little thingies and it couldn't even reach its chin. You know, I, I think it did, like with birds, uh, some of the non-flying, the flightless birds, they did everything with just the beak and the two legs and uh, the rest maybe is for balance, something like that. I don't All know. Right. Was T-Rex a carnivore or a herbivore? I've never watched it eat. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, uh, it was created as a herbivore because God says in Genesis 1 that he created um, uh, plants for all these creatures to be food for all the creatures. Uh, It was only after sin entered the world that creatures began to eat one another and violence crept in. And and, um, so God gave these creatures teeth and the teeth are there to to eat whatever they can. So they they would have used those big T-Rex teeth to chomp, I guess, giant melons or something in the pre-flood world. uh, so uh, uh, it, it turned into a carnivore later, sure did. Uh, uh, the reason I know is because we have T-Rex-shaped tooth gouges in other dinosaurs' bones, indicating that T-Rex scavenged these, uh, these other dinosaurs. Wow, that's fascinating. All right, when were dinosaurs created during the creation week? In other, in other words, which day? Who knows? Day six. Day six. Yep. All right. Would dinosaurs ever have the possibility in the future to come alive again? No, you got to have the whole dinosaur to make a new dinosaur. You got to have a mommy and a womb and everything to make a, the next uh, creature. So, you, so Jurassic Park, you can't just take the DNA and combine it with um, imagination and make anything real. You have to have <laughs> the mom. All right. Were dinosaurs alive when Jesus was on the earth? I don't know. I wasn't around then either. They could have been. I, I, I don't, who's putting these questions up here? <laughs> You're supposed to vet the questions first. No, that's a good question. People, people are asking these. These are good questions. Yeah, this is your team. <laughs> why did dinosaurs grow so big? Why? 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 Um, 
Well, some of them grew big, I think, as a means of defense. Some of them had horns and armor and things to defend themselves with, but others, like sauropods, didn't have armor. Um, So God provided for them, I think, uh, the means to grow really fast so that they could be the biggest boy on the block, and and that would be their defense. And uh, the hadrosaur is an example of one that grew big, and these several dinosaurs grew their entire lives like an anaconda grows its entire life. Some didn't. Some grew to the size of a turkey, and then they just stayed there. Um, so the, we moved on to the next question, so I don't remember what it was. Why did they grow so big? Why did they grow so big? Because that's how God wanted it. <laughs> All right. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do two more questions. Okay. Why don't we see human fossils mixed in with dinosaur fossils? Great question. I get this everywhere I go. And uh, I actually have three answers, and it's going to take me like at least five minutes to answer this. So hang with me. Why don't we see human, if humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, why don't we see their fossils together? Uh, one reason is because the rock layers that contain dinosaur fossils have all these creatures and plants from swamps. Most people don't like swamps, you know, unless you're the swamp people people. Would, <laughs> is that a TV show? It's like one person with, surrounded by miles and miles of swamps, so it's very rare to find people in swamps. I think the same would have been true in the pre-flood world, and you throw some monsters into the mix, and you've got people who really don't want to live in the swamp. So, so we, have, um, we have swamp creatures, we've got parrots, loons, ducks, albatross, all mixed up with dinosaur fossils, so water birds, water plants. Um, so, I, I, so I don't think that people were, were in the same place on Earth. They were alive at the same time somewhere else on Earth. Um, Maybe I should just stop there. There's other answers. Well, let me give a second answer to that question. 99% of paleontology is conducted by secular, evolutionary thinking scientists. If they were to discover a bone from a human in a dinosaur rock layer, do I have confidence that they would properly and accurately identify it as a human bone? I have no confidence at all. And I have evidence that they would fail to do it right. Because they found a human foot bone, the fourth metatarsal, in an African layer that they deemed, they designated as three million years old. Just three million. Now that's about a million years before, a million and a half years before humans were supposed to have evolved. So they said this can't be a human bone because it predates humanity according to our, our belief system. So what was their conclusion? This ape walked like a man. <laughs> Seriously, published in the journal Science in 20, I think 2010. So they totally misidentified this perfectly human foot bone. And uh, uh, so I have no confidence that they, that, they, that they would properly. So there may be human remains with dinosaur remains. We just haven't been told. All right. And this will be the last question. Last question. <sighs> I'm not sure. I can't read that. What is my, is that Microraptor? Micro. What is Microraptor, bird or dinosaur? Yeah, this assumes I know something about dinosaurs. Um, no, I think it was a, I think it was a bird. So we have these extinct, uh, I think they're extinct, birds with uh, four wings. So they had two wings in the front, but their hind legs had feathers. And so they would use their hind legs to sort of, I don't know, fly like a dragonfly or something. <laughs> and, um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a bird. Yeah, I'd say bird. It's a trick, though. It's a good question because um, there are two tactics that evolutionists use to support their belief that dinosaurs evolved into birds. At least two tactics. Well, three. One is to create a fraud, which is what they did um, uh, in uh, National Geographic. Um, and they had to retract it. Um, but another is to, um, is to take a bird fossil because it's got these flight feathers and they say, look at that dinosaur. So they just rename it a dinosaur. So now we say we have a feathered dinosaur when it's actually just a feathered bird. Maybe it was a bird with four wings instead of two, but they call a bird a dinosaur in order to confuse me. And, um, and the third and last one is, um, is that they misinterpret skin fibers as feathers. They're actually just dead, rotted skin fibers. So that's a long question, a long answer for a short and good question. 